In this video, I'm going to take compositions of two composers from young composers and utterly transform their music from poorly formatted MIDI files into professional sounding performances. I'm also going to go over which techniques I use to make these transformations. And what I discovered about these two compositions is absolutely stunning. So be sure you stick around because these before and after results are quite shocking and reveal some amazing characteristics of these composers. The results also reveal the potential of Music Jotter's playback engine. Before I introduce to you who today's composers are, first I want to talk to you about Music Jotter's playback. You're going to notice that the playback system is color-coded, but this is so that you can see the velocity nuances. You'll also notice a highly responsive playback. In a good playback system, you want your playback to have almost no latency. So in order to achieve the results that you are about to hear, a low latent playback system is critical. And the stars of today's show will be Henry and Peter. Henry is known for writing short sketches, but there was one sketch in particular that caught my interest, and we're going to analyze that sketch today. So here's an introduction to Henry's Waltz 10 before the transformation. And Peter's submission was his etude in A-flat. This piece is highly chromatic in nature, which just means that it doesn't follow the traditional diatonic scale. So an example of a diatonic scale is, let's say, your basic C major or C minor scale. You'll notice that the scale is made up of five whole tones and two semitones. But with the chromatic scale, we're just not adhering to all the notes within a key signature in a strict manner. And the composer will often opt to use every note within, let's say, within an octave. So this is just a simplified explanation, but I want to give you some basic information around this piece since it's a bit complex. So it's not exactly atonal, but it has some atonal traits. So here's now an introduction to Peter's etude before the transformation. Before I go on to the transformations, what exactly makes a MIDI file sound like a performance? Contrary to belief, good instrument sounds and reverb have little to do with realistic playback, but what matters most in making your playback sound authentic has to do with these five things. Tempo, velocity, duration, attack, and articulations. An articulation would be your accents, staccato, marcato, legato, etc. So if you can utilize these five properties correctly in your composition, you can make a simple composition stand out. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I am big on a good playback system, and I'll be implementing my techniques into Music Jotter. And if I can prove to you that I can transform robotic-sounding music into performance, 
then I can hopefully get you on board with my mission. And that mission is to create an easy to use, accessible music notation software that not only helps you make your music look good, but also sound good as well. Okay, let's do our first side-by-side -side comparison now. I'm going to analyze the first part of Henry's Waltz, which consists of an intro followed by the first theme. So here's what I did to nuance this work. At the beginning of this introduction, I implemented a pretty basic accelerando, which just means a gradual increase in speed. This accelerando helps to show the listener that this is separate from the rest of the piece and adds a little bit of color. I also add in a slight swing to help emphasize this waltz beat. So in each measure, Beat 2 is actually a faster tempo than beat 1 and 3, which is how I achieved these results. And this simple tweak makes this piece sound more authentic throughout. The chords also have an attack, which gives it that more realistic playing feel. And in the right hand, we have trills that I emphasize with accented notes. The tempo speed is also increased for the 16th notes to emphasize the energy of this piece. And finally, I added sustained pedaling in various places, but I especially did this during the upwards note run. So I combined this note run with random, subtle attacks, and this, in my opinion, seals the deal for this piece. Okay, now let's listen to part two of this piece before the first repeat. There are two more techniques that I implemented. The first thing that you're going to notice is a major tempo decrease when we get into the second theme. The reason why I do this is to add a sense of drama to this piece while emphasizing a mood change. This mood change is actually very quite beautiful and we don't want to rush through this part. Therefore, a good tactic to use is a tempo decrease in this situation. Composers often forget that basic tempo changes can really transform and change up a piece, and it's equivalent to adding punctuation in a, sen in a sentence. The meaning of a sentence can completely change with different punctuation marks, so just keep that in mind. And the second thing that I did was I added in three notes in the left hand right here. accented a few notes to give a sort of pseudo counterpoint feeling to this musical phrase. While I was nuancing this work, I realized that there was a trending note ascension and it sounded interesting to me. So I created this pseudo motif and I experimented with accents and just, just three note changes. So let me know in the comments below if you like this change or if you prefer the original. So let's listen to the section one more time.
Whether or not Henry agrees with my interpretation of his music, we have yet to find out. But I thought that this added some interesting color to the piece. And now for the final part of Henry's waltz. Let's see how I handled the repeat. You're going to notice that all I did was increase the tempo of these measures here. And wow, what a difference this makes. The tempo increase breaks up the rhythm a bit and also adds a bit of fun to this waltz. So let's listen to that one more time. While the transformation of Henry's waltz is unbelievable, <laughs> My improvements just bring out the beauty of this piece in ways that were missing from the original MIDI file. I'm now going to play the full recording of Henry's Waltz, but don't worry, it's only a minute long. But before I play this recording, I want to remind you that if you enjoy my MIDI transformations so far, and you want to see me do more of these types of videos in the future, don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and to subscribe. And also don't forget to check out some of my other content on this channel. I put a lot of time into these videos and, and I think you're going to enjoy them. Okay, now onto the recording. Next, we're going to analyze Peter's Etude in A-flat. And this piece is actually rather complex. However, it's an incredible piece of music, and we want to make sure that people fully appreciate it. So let's piece out the problems first, and then we'll make those corrections. And at a first listen to the MIDI, I knew right away that the biggest problem here would be the one strict tempo that's being used throughout the piece. And the reason why this is a problem is due to these arpeggios right here and these 64th notes right over here and also these triplets over here so let's listen to these phrases as is The fast parts of this music are just a little hard to understand because of the strict tempo. But the good news is, all we need to do to fix this problem is to adjust the tempo. And let me tell you that this tweak makes a tremendous difference. In fact, while I was nuancing this piece, I was starting to pick up on some Ravel traits, which was a pleasant surprise. So let's start with the side-by-side -side comparison of the beginning of this piece.
Here's what I did. Aside from varying the velocity changes to simulate a more realistic performance, once we get into these arpeggios here, you will immediately notice that I slow these measures down a lot. Once the ear gets accustomed to the start of this arpeggio, I then speed it up with an accelerando. If you listen closely, I actually use an even faster tempo than Peter's original tempo, because now we can safely ease the ear into this fast tempo. After all, this is a virtuosic piece. So let's listen to that again. The tempo is definitely faster, but it sounds a lot smoother now because of the tempo reduction at the beginning of the measure here. It's a lot easier to hear what this section is about now because you can fully appreciate this piano phrase. This next section is really interesting because the harmonies are chromatic in nature, but if played correctly, it sounds really good, which you're going to hear soon. But first, let's have a quick listen to the original recording. So here we have a constant tempo. Then the sustain pedal is implemented as we increase our volume. This unfortunately muddles the music due to the lack of articulations and this increased velocity. However, with the right techniques, we can make this sound to perfection. Let's hear our next side-by-side -side comparison. Just wow, what a huge difference that makes. And the reason for this difference lies in the fact that I vary the velocity of the higher notes and I lower the velocities of the lower notes. And this is so that we are not overwhelming the ear with all of this note data. But we still have the composer's original intent, which is to play this passage as a crescendo. I also implement Another trick right here with an accelerando, which helps emphasize the crescendo without going too crazy on velocity. Do you think that this section sounds more realistic after these implementations? The next side-by-side -side comparison really shocked me because this is where I started to hear some Ravel. And just in case you don't know, Ravel was a musical genius who basically adopted his own style of music, but he also got associated with the Impressionism era. Peter gave his own music an injustice in this case because he kept this one tempo. So let's now listen to a side-by-side -side comparison. And be sure you're sitting down for this one because this is a transformation of the century. This is just incredible, and I, and I have no words. When I first heard this section, I really didn't know what I was listening to because it was just a little bit too fast. But as I, as I was nuancing this piece of music right here, 
I realized that I had to slow it down for two for two reasons. The first reason is you have to let the human ear decipher what it's listening to. And the second reason is that this section is just so well done and beautiful. You need to slow it down just so that it lasts just a little bit longer. And while we are listening to this part, let me know in the comments below what you think of this specific transformation. I know it left me speechless. The original MIDI file recording of this etude does this piece a huge injustice. I knew that this piece was a work of art, but after my nuancing techniques, I hope you all can now see the true beauty of this music. In fact, this, I believe that this piece is a masterpiece. It took me approximately two hours to nuance once I had a grasp of the music, and I'm glad I went through this piece with you all today. Let's now listen to the full recording of this piece. It's only a minute long. I want to thank Henry and Peter for letting me use their compositions in today's demonstration. And I hope that both of these MIDI transformations continue to demonstrate why I am such an advocate of a good playback system in Music Daughter. If you want to start using my nuancing techniques, you need to follow me because the software that I'm creating will support these techniques but I would need your continued support so that we can get Music Jotter out into the world. And now I'm going to conclude with this. Click here for part one of me nuancing Quinn's etude, and click here for part two of that series. Thank you all. <laughs>